In 1799, while constructing a fort in Egypt, a group of French soldiers came across an ancient Egyptian tablet containing hieroglyphics on it. What made the discovery of this tablet so groundbreaking was not just the fact that it contained hieroglyphics, because by this point, quite a few stones with that script had already been discovered. It was what came with the hieroglyphics that made this stone so important, Greek. Because while for over a thousand years no one had been able to read the ancient Egyptian script, everyone trained in classical languages could read Greek. This discovery, 40 years later, enabled the French scholar Jean-François Champollion to finally decode the meaning of the hieroglyphics. The symbols which had been silent for over a millennium became a new window into ancient Egyptian life and culture. Today, in the first few decades of the 21st century, we are faced with a challenge and an opportunity similar to that of the Rosetta Stone. It comes from a language which dwarfs any human language in the immense number of volumes written in it, and that's the language of DNA. DNA contains the blueprints for every biological process of every living thing on Earth, and even a small defect in the genetic code can cause devastating health consequences. Understanding how genes work, both individually and with each other, is crucial to the development of 21st century personalized medicine. The problem is that even when we actually have an organism's DNA in front of us, it's often not easy to tell what an individual gene does. Even more difficult can be teasing out the subtle influences that multiple genes have on each other. But answering those kinds of questions is foundational to attacking genetically influenced diseases at their root cause. Forty years ago, even if we had had all the genetic information that we have today, which, by the way, we didn't, most of it's been found in the last 20 years, but even if we had, we could not have even begun to sift through it. An army of people would never have had time to sift through the enormous amount of genetic data needed to answer health-related questions. Today, however, a new subfield of biology is being developed that is making what formerly seemed impossible into a reality. That field is bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is the application of statistics and information theory to genetic data. It allows us to sift through an enormous amount of that data in a way that would be impossible to do manually. And let me give you an example of how bioinformatics can be useful. There's a very common classic statistical procedure called the two-sample t-test. And its purpose is if we have two groups and we want to know if the average number of individuals with a certain feature in this group is the same as the average number of individuals with that feature in this group, we run the test to find out. So for example, if I have two jars of marbles, red marbles and blue marbles in each jar, and I want to know if the average number of red marbles in a handful from this jar is going to be the same as the average number of red marbles in a handful from this jar, I can run the test by taking a sample of maybe 30 marbles from this jar, 30 marbles from this jar, and then counting up the number of times red marbles appear in each handful. Once I have those two numbers, I plug them back into the ugly equation you just saw, and what I get back is the probability that I have this number of red marbles in this hand and this number of red marbles in this hand that we just got if both jars have the same number of red marbles. That may seem arcane, but let me give you an example of how we can use it in bioinformatics. Suppose we want to find out whether a particular gene is associated with thyroid cancer. We could take a sample of maybe the genomes of 100 people with the cancer and 100 healthy people, and then count the number of times a gene appears in each group. Once we have those two numbers, just like with the marbles, we plug them back into the equation, and what we get back, remember, is the probability that that, that gene appears this many times in the cancer group and this many times in the healthy group if you're equally likely to have the gene whether you have the cancer or not. And if that probability is sufficiently low, we usually use the cutoff point of maybe 5%, then we can conclude that it's very likely that gene does have some sort of association with the cancer. This is a paradigm example of what makes bioinformatics so useful. We started with an ocean of genetic data, the full genomes of 200 people, and using statistics have narrowed our focus down to just one gene, 
that can then be further studied by geneticists. Now, I've given you <clears throat> a little bit of an idea of how we can use bioinformatics, but you may still be wondering why a specifically genetic understanding of how disease works is important. And to answer that question, I want to take one particularly cruel condition as an example. Cystic fibrosis is a genetically inherited mutation that causes progressive lung disease. And the way that works is everybody's lungs, CF or not, have a thin mucus lining, the purpose of which is to catch bacteria and other irritants so they can then be coughed out of the lungs and an infection doesn't start. In CF patients, the mucus lining is much thicker, which means it does what it's supposed to in catching the bacteria, but it keeps them in the lungs. The very thing which is intended to stop an infection becomes a breeding ground for those same bacteria. Over time, the thickened mucus clogs the airways, inflammation spreads throughout the lungs, and in 80% of CF patients, this leads to death by lung failure. Now, there are two reasons why I picked CF as my example for how we can use bioinformatics. The first, on a more optimistic note that I'll get to in just a minute, is that the past few years have seen some major advances in how cystic fibrosis is treated, and those advances were based upon a deep understanding of how the mutated CFTR gene works. The second, however, is that when I'm standing up here in front of all of you talking about bioinformatics and disease research, do not think that this is just some sort of interesting intellectual exercise that you'll hear and go home and forget about. It's not for me, and it shouldn't be for you either. Because I am speaking to you first and foremost, not as a statistics major, and first and foremost, not as someone who wants to study bioinformatics in graduate school, but as someone who has cystic fibrosis. And on my behalf, and on behalf of the other 100,000 people worldwide with CF, I am telling you, our lives depend on our ability to better understand how the mutated gene works. Prior to about four years ago, all the existing treatments for CF could be boiled down to two things, clearing mucus out of the lungs and killing the bacteria that had gotten into the lungs. These were both helpful, but neither of them actually addressed the root cause of the condition, which is the thickened mucus. Thickened mucus in CF lungs is caused by defective chloride channels in the lung cells. And so if you can imagine cystic fibrosis as like a giant hole in your bathtub wall with water gushing out of it, everything we've had so far has basically been ways of just devising larger buckets to scoop the water out faster so the tub doesn't flood. This works for a little while, it's been effective in bringing up the CF lifespan from about 10 years in 1970 to 37 years today. But as long as the water is still gushing freely out of the wall, as long as the chloride shells are still malfunctioning, the problem isn't really fixed. In the last four years, two new CF drugs, Kaleidico and Orcambi, have been developed that partially repair the defective chloride channels in the cells. They're not cures but they're the first step towards patching over the hole. And the only way we were ever able to develop such drugs was by understanding deeply, intricately, how the mutated gene works. The decoding of hieroglyphics was no doubt an important milestone in our understanding of ancient Egypt. But however fascinating such an intellectual pursuit may be, it does not begin to compare in importance, in urgency, <coughs> to our race to translate genetic information into the material for new disease treatments. Lives are being lost every day to heritable and genetically influenced diseases while we possess the information needed to save them walked away right in front of us. If we are to combat the worldwide rise in cancer incidents, the untold suffering in the global south from numerous virally caused tropical illnesses, and conditions like cystic fibrosis, which have destroyed millions of lives through its long history, then we must continue to expand our genetic Rosetta Stone, and we must use that stone to better understand diseases at their root causes. I challenge my generation to be one that will be remembered as one which made full use of its mathematical and biological advances to save lives and end suffering. 
The Egyptian culture, which gave us the hieroglyphics, has passed into history, and all that remains of their civilization are the monuments they have left to us. The day will come when we too, like the Egyptians, are nothing but a thing of the past to those who come after, and they will know that we were the first generation entrusted with bioinformatics with all its potential for human health. And when that day comes, when we are nothing but a memory to those who come after, when all that is left of us on earth is what we have done, let this be our monument to them, that we pushed medicine into an undreamt of frontiers, that we left behind a better understanding of disease than had ever been possible before, that we took up every weapon bioinformatics has given us and continue this fight against human disease. Thank you. <laughs>